good to be in the house of God today. Amen. Amen. What a what a privilege that we have in being able to come into His presence and just to hear about what He is doing in our in our lives and, and in the midst of His of His children of His people and how we've been chosen as a holy generation um, set aside for such a time as this and and what a privilege that you have and I have to be able to be here um, and. You know, this, this year we're expecting greater things. This year we're expecting the, the, the Spirit of God to, to just really break out and uh, really manifest Himself in some great ways. And, and if you've joined us in the fast these uh, past three days, I, I want to say thank you, but, but I can tell you this, you've benefited from it more than you know. You know, I, I, was, I was sharing this with uh, Peter on the way here this morning. And I told him, I said, you know, God, He gave us a way to, to come into His presence. If we ever lose our way, if we ever find ourselves distance from Him, He's given us the fast so that we can, so that we can crucify the flesh and enter into His presence. And He guarantees that when we begin to seek Him with all of our heart, that we will find Him. And I tell you, no other religion guarantees such a fact. No other religion guarantees such a thing. And so we, we are honored to be able to come into His presence and to know who He is. Amen. And, and, and allow Him to change you. As, as was taught in the class this morning, I think one of the things that continually sticks out to me in the book of James, is, 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 and that was brought up in the class this morning, is that, that as believers now, new uh, believers in Christ Jesus, new new beings. Uh, we no longer sin. That's not our nature anymore. That's not who we. That's not who we are. That, that may have been who we were, but that's not who we are. And if we find ourselves again falling back into that, we have an advocate with the Father. But the answer to that is getting into His presence. Daniel says that they that know their God shall do exploits. We're continuing from where we were last week. I wanted to continue uh, and follow this uh, a little deeper as we move forward. The thing is, is that we need to know God. You see, it's possible to know Christ theologically and not know His presence. It's possible to know about Jesus and not actually know His presence. We touched on this a little bit, as I said last week, and we had talked about how we can know our favorite uh, sports star. We, we know all about them. We know where they were born. We know what size shoe they wear. We know where they went to school. We know what team they, went, they play for. We know all their stats. We know everything about them. And it's possible to know all about them, but never know them personally. They never called you up on the telephone to say hello and, and tell you their deepest thoughts. You see, I believe that so many believers are in this very position. They know about Christ, but they do not know His presence, what it is to be in relationship. It's a startling thing to most people that it's possible to know Christ, as I said, theologically, but not know His presence. Yet I can tell you without contradiction, and without fear of contradiction, that this is an absolute truth. And this is something that as the church we need to be aware of. To know Jesus Christ personally. I want to take you to a story just to kind of show you and, and lay it out for you. Uh, Luke 24. I'm going to read a little bit. And this is why I didn't want to choose this one as my, my, my opening scripture. Because there's a little bit to read and, and I didn't want you standing that long. But uh, Luke 24, it's possible to know God the theologically. It's, 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 a, it's a scary thing when we come to understand this. But at the same time, it's, it's a, it comes as a mo at a moment in time when we have to take note and, and really inventory and ask ourselves, do I know Jesus Christ? Or do I merely know about Jesus Christ? What's the difference? Heaven and hell, that's the difference. Life and death, that's the difference. 
Can I tell you this? The Bibles, the Bible says that the devils know who he is and they shudder. Can I tell you, they're still going to hell. Because they don't know him intimately. They had refused to, to know him and to continue with him. And so the Bible says that God cast a third of the angels down because Satan had deceived them. Can I tell you, we can be deceived in the same manner. But in Luke chapter 24, verse 13, I want to read this for you. I want you to, 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 to try to just stay with me and try to understand as we read. Verse 13, And behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together, this is the day of His resurrection, remember, and reasoned, Jesus Himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk are you, and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and has not known the things which have come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have, had, and have, been, have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have been redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Verse 24. And certain of them were with us, went to the sepulcher and found it even as the women had said but him they saw not and he said unto them O fools slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken ought not christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory and beginning at moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone no further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass as he sat with meat at meat with them, he took the bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scripture? You see, at this moment, Jesus had drawn near to these two disciples that were walking. They found themselves in a, in a deep theological discussion. They were, they were buried in, in, in this discussion. Their minds were so full of the things uh, that, that had just taken place. They were trying to piece together everything that had just happened. You see, sometimes we get in our lives and, and, and we try to learn about Christ and we, we, we grab other things books and we look to other things and we search the scriptures at times and, and we look through the word of God because maybe we, we've gone through something hard and we're looking for an answer. How is God going to deliver me? What is God going to do in these circumstances? Did not God promise something and we're not seeing it come to pass? That was the state of these two disciples. They were talking about Jesus. How he was a prophet, mighty indeed. 
how He was crucified. And while they were in the middle of their discussion, Jesus walks right in, in, in verse 16. And the Bible says that they did not even know Him. Now it's a it's a picture of so much of our discussion. We have we, we, we have theological debates and we have we have discussions about who Jesus is and, and what is the what is the truth and what is the right way and, and, and should I should I live like this or should I live like that? And in all of our discussions we do not include Jesus Christ. Because many times we want to debate. We want to live as close to the world as we can. And yet we want to serve God. But, but, but our heart is divided. And the Bible says that a divided heart or a double-minded man is unstable in all of their ways. It's a clear picture. They wanted to believe in Jesus Christ and, and who He was and what He was doing. And theologically they knew all the, the ins and outs. But, but can I tell you, it's the curse, it's the same curse that was upon them, it's the same curse that's on our time, that Jesus Christ is missing out of so much of even our theology. As I was sitting there this morning in the teaching this morning, I thought to myself, these words came to my mind, the scripture came to my heart, that men in the end times would not be able to endure sound doctrine. Because as James said, we can go on, but we are no longer, we do no longer live in sin any longer. And yet, how many of us want to live in sin? And when, when a doctrine of truth comes and challenges us, we don't want to hear it. Because we don't want Christ, we don't want the conviction, we just want the blessing. We just want the things that God says were, are going to be ours, but, but we don't want, as, as she spoke this morning, we don't want that, that, that chastening of the Lord. We don't want to be corrected by God in His Word. And it's a hard thing, but I can tell you this, you can't have one without the other. You see, it's the sound doctrine that is missing. See, you cannot know Christ except through, through, through theology, through correct doctrine. We need, to, we need correct doctrine. But, but I, I don't want to, to minimize our doctrine in any way. Sound doctrine is a, is a necessity for us to know Jesus Christ. But to seek to know Christ apart from Scripture, because to, see, to, to know Him apart from Scripture would lead, lead to fallacy. It would lead us into to perdition. It would lead us into occultism. And, and we would find ourselves lost in some other kind of religion. And we've seen it all through time. Can I tell you, you don't need any other book but the book that you are holding this morning. That book that says the Holy Bible. That's the book you need. There's no other substitute. There's no other supplement for the Word of God. If anything would lead you astray, I'm telling you, get rid of it and stick with the Word of God. So it's possible to have a great understanding theologically, but be a stranger to Christ Himself. Not to know Jesus Christ. I would dare say that there are many theologians that are out there that, that, that they, can, they can debate you but they don't know Jesus Christ. I don't know how many people that I've run into that they can quote to me scriptures and they can try to argue with me. I've learned in my walk, I don't argue the scriptures. The truth doesn't need to be argued. It merely needs to be stated. You deal with it. Amen? You deal with it. This is the truth of God's Word. I don't have to argue you about it. All I have to do is state it. And that settles it because... God said it. doesn't matter whether you or I believe it. Amen? Amen? God said it. So we look and we see even at Martha when she's at the tomb of Lazarus. She has a very sound doctrine. She knows that Jesus Christ is the resurrection. But the resurrection, you know, I, I thought about this. The resurrection isn't merely an event. He's a person. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me. 
And so she's sitting here, and, and even though she knows all about the resurrection and, and even gets into a little bit of a theological debate with Jesus Christ and says, oh, well, I know about the resurrection, that in the end times that, that the dead and cry, that, that the dead are going to rise. And Jesus says, I am. Do you not know me? You see, it was the same Martha. Martha, Martha, Martha. Who was so busy about the work that she didn't take time to get intimate with Jesus Christ and sit at his feet and learn from him. I can tell you if, if, if the fast will teach you anything, it'll teach you how little you pay attention to your spiritual life and how much you pay attention to your physical needs but so little to the spiritual needs. You see, when we become desperate in our search, that's what the fast is really for. When you finally really want to know who Jesus Christ is, you'll be willing to fast and do whatever it takes to get a hold of Him. Let something take a hold of you. Let something, let something grip your life. And I'm telling you, you'll want to know who Jesus Christ is. Can I tell you, He's still the resurrection and the life. He's still the healer. But you know what? You may not know that healing power until you come to a point where you need it. And then you'll desperately seek Him. And the Bible says that He will be found of you. But the problem is, is we don't hunger and thirst after righteousness anymore. And we're not hungry and seeking the face of God. We've become so busy about a million other things and we've forsaken the one person that means everything. So you see, the Emmaus Road disciples, they could quote all the facts about Jesus, but they didn't recognize Jesus while He was talking and speaking to them. I've often said, Christ is always speaking, but are you listening? He's always speaking. He's always ministering. He's always manifesting Himself to you and to me. But many times our eyes are closed to the Word of God. You can find it. The Bible says in, in, in praying, open our eyes. It's not, a, it's not a matter of God not doing a work. It's not a matter of God not moving in our midst. It's not a matter of God not being here among us present. It's a matter of our eyes are not open and our ears cannot hear and we cannot sense the presence of God because it wasn't about it wasn't about God. It's about you and me being in the right place. So true revelation is a result of intimate communion with Christ. True revelation is a result of intimate communion with Christ. The Emmaus Road disciples, their eyes were open. When he began breaking bread with them. It's very significant. You see, we, we have to notice that, that an intimate revelation of Christ, it wasn't separate from, the, from sound doctrine, but Jesus began with Moses. He went through all the prophets. He began to expound all things concerning himself. So, so sound doctrine, as we said, is a must. But, but, but it was only in the breaking of the bread that he revealed himself. You see, some people, and I've met them, they like to argue the Scriptures. They like to argue the dispensations. They like to argue, what, what are you? Pre-trib, pre -trib, pro post-trib, or mid-trib? I mean, they, they want to argue if Jesus is ever coming back. They, want to, they, they, they know the Scripture. They, they know all about the Scripture. But they've never entered into communion with Jesus Christ. You see, we've become very pharisaical, if I could say. So much a Pharisee when we begin to learn the Scripture, there's no intimacy with Jesus Christ. When there's intimacy with Jesus Christ, there's compassion. When there's intimacy with Jesus Christ, we, we, we begin to become like Him and have a heart like His. Our heart begins to break over the things that His heart breaks for. But if we don't have it, that intimate relationship, we, be, we can become so brash in our approach that we don't even take thought of the person's soul that is lost and dying and going to hell. 
You see, we wouldn't pray for them, but we sure will argue with them. But how is this all done? How do we come into communion with Him? You see, it's in prayer that we commune with Him. It's at the table of our heart that God comes and He sits down. Our eyes will be open and, and we will once again truly see Jesus for who He is. As we, as we open our hearts, as it's, it's at that prayer table. You see, people who don't pray, they can know a, a lot about God, but people who pray know God. Amen. You see, and, 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 and that's so much of the problem, is we know about God. And we become frustrated because we know about God. And when we have a problem, when we have a need, we, we, we think we know God and, and we know about God and we'll quote scriptures. And, and that's a good thing. Know the scriptures. Know the word of God. The word of God, by the word of God, you're, you're able to come against the enemy. But it's not by the word of God alone. Because Satan knows God's word. And he can even use it against us. But, but, but it's because we have never entered into the intimate fellowship with Jesus that's why it seems sometimes, and let me put this out there because, because it's going to be a, a light bulb for so many. That's why sometimes it seems the Scripture doesn't work. Now don't sit there and look at me like a, like a deer in headlights. We many times, we, we think the Scriptures don't work because we've quoted the Scriptures We've done what the Scriptures have said, but we've never walked in intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, that was the, that was the difference. That was the difference with, with the life of Jesus Christ and your life and my life. You see, the Scriptures always worked for Jesus, but they don't always seem to work for us. But Jesus was always in relationship to the Father there was never a moment where he had broken fellowship with his father. With us, it, on the other hand, we, it takes us many times a long time before we actually set aside some time to pray. Many of us will make resolutions this year. And we'll, we'll break them. We'll set out to, to lose weight. We'll set out to, to get on a diet. We'll set out to do all of those things and, and we'll say something within our resolutions, but many won't keep them. How many of us, and I don't want to show of hands, just, just in your own heart, in your own mind, one of your resolutions, and, and I think sometimes this just becomes a religious thing, is to get closer to God. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to pray more. And do all those things, but just like just like every other resolution, you may start off the first day or two, but because you don't sense anything and nothing moves you, you'll 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 let that drop off. Can I tell you? Don't forget Jesus. You may see it in this life that, that I don't really I don't really need it right now. Jesus may not be as big of a priority to you right now. He needs to be your main priority. Amen. Eternity lies in the balance. Amen. You see, the first priority for, for true service is to, is to follow Jesus. In John chapter 12 and verse 26, it says, If any man will serve me, let him follow me. Let him follow me. See, the emphasis here is on let him follow me. Jesus forces no one to follow Him. It's a choice. Will you follow Jesus? See, so many Christians and, and have it backwards. They say in their hearts, if Christ wants me, let Him follow me. And they say, this is, these are my plans, and this is what I'm going to do. And Christ knows where I'm at. And if He wants anything to do with me, He knows where to find me. Now you wouldn't say that right out blatantly, but you don't have to. 
Because as my mom always used to say, and her theology was great, actions speak louder than words. What we do says more many times than what we say. And Jesus says, come follow me. See, it means first to set our hearts upon him. To set our hearts upon him. To know him. To, 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 to walk in relationship to him. It means to seek him. To seek him diligently. I want to know Jesus Christ. If you're tired of your life, if you're tired of living this endless rat race, if you're tired of, of being on this endless cycle, then I'm telling you, you need to know Jesus Christ. If you're tired of bowing your knee to the sin and the things that are destroying you and destroying your relationships and destroying your, your positions and whatever else it may be, then you need to, get, you need to begin to seek Him and seek to know who He is. It means, in all understanding, it means to minister to Him. Now, I'm gonna, I want to delve into this just a little bit right here. To minister to Him. See, when we seek the Lord in prayer and, and, and search His Word to know Him, then we're, we're at the highest point of usefulness. When we, when we come to that place where we're seeking Him, when we're praying and we're, and we're, and we're in, in just serving Him, we think that it's, that it's when we find ourselves in a position. No, 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 no. It's not when you find yourself in a position. If there's any position, then it's the position that is down on your knees, submitted and humbled before the mighty hand of God and under the mighty hand of God. Amen. That's when you're at your strongest. Because it's not, it's not just because somebody can sit up and, and, and speak from a pulpit or, or somebody is, is the pastor of the church. I pray that, that pastors would seek God and would be in a position where they're seeking God and God is using them. But it's not always the case. Sometimes it's, it's the person that, that is just out there in obscurity. It's the intercessor, the one who knows the presence of God and has not forsaken that. That is ready to serve. See, no matter, no matter what you do, you're never more useful to God than when you're praying. And, and that's, just, that's just the bottom line. That's the absolute truth. See, ministry will flow out of, uh, out of a vital communication with Jesus Christ, out of your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where ministry comes from. Ministry doesn't come from your abilities. It doesn't come because you have an ability to do something. After all, the only reason you have an ability to do anything is because Christ Himself has given you that ability. But many people think, well, I can do this and I can give this to Christ. Well, I'm glad that you can do that. And I pray that you will do that. But first of all, it has to come from a relationship that only comes from, from an intimate walk with Jesus Christ. See, as we, as we learn the secret of ministering to God, our ministry will continue to expand. And, and, and then our sphere of influence will, will begin to, to reach out into places we never dreamed. How many of us want to show up before God empty-handed one day? None of us want to show up empty-handed before God. I want to be able to present something to Him because of all that He's done for me. I want to be able to say, Jesus, you know, I surrender to You. And the only reason that I have anything to offer You is because of You. But if you're, if you're out there and you're doing it on your own, and you're forcing the thing to, to happen. And you're forcing the, the, the ministry. And you're forcing those things. And you're doing it in your own strength. Can I tell you what? All you're storing up is wood, hay, and stubble. And all of that is going to be as nothing on that day. But it's when we come to that place and, and we're working with Christ to minister. See, all levels of ministry are seen in the life and, and ministry of Paul. All levels. As a Pharisee, he persecuted the church. If you asked him what he was doing, he would have told you, I'm doing the will of God. I'm working for God. 
The Bible says that he, he, he even said that because of the zeal, his zeal was the one that caused him to go out there and persecute the church. Why? Because he didn't have intimate fellowship with God. They say that Paul was, was one of the six greatest theologians, greatest minds that had ever graced this planet. But yet before Christ... He knew all about the, 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 the theology. He knew all about the scriptures. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. But he didn't have that relationship with Christ. And nothing, nothing was coming out of it but death itself. Jesus said the day will come when those who persecute you will think that they're doing a service for God according to John 16 and 2. See, that was Saul of, of, Tars, of Tarsus. He thought he was doing God a, a favor. And, and many people that are in ministry think that they are doing God a favor and a service, but they're not in relationship to God. And the enemy, in, in those times, the enemy can come in and very easily persuade you. You think about this, husbands, wives. You're the ministers of your home. You're the ones that are watching over the flock of your own household. And if you know all about God, but there is no intimate relationship with God, then you are leading your family astray. And the devil has you right where he wants you. He'd rather have you thinking that you are right with God rather than being right with God. It takes an intimate relationship and a walk with God to know where we are. You see, straight away the Bible says in the second level that Paul, Paul's ministry in verse 20 of Acts chapter 9 says straight away he preached Christ. You see, at this moment he's working with God. In Galatians chapter 1, 16 through 18, Paul stopped his religious labor and went into the desert. And for three years he separated himself in a prayer meeting with Christ himself. Think about that. Three years he separated himself. And in the desert, Paul learned the secret of ministering unto God. Ministering out of the wealth that he had received. And he came forth. And out of that came forth a pure revelation of who Jesus Christ was. And no one could tell him otherwise. See, many have been deceived. Paul said even to the foolish Galatians, he said, who has bewitched you? Who has fooled you after receiving the gospel of peace and after receiving the truth? You were bewitched. Why? The only reason they were bewitched was because they had lost fellowship with Jesus Christ. The only reason that you can be deceived is because you fall out of relationship with Jesus Christ. But it was out of that abundance, out of the fullness of Jesus. You see, when He was working for God, his life was focused upon a need. And he touched a small core of people. But when he moved into the third level of ministry, he moved past ministry unto God and became a laborer with God. And he touched the world. So much and so many Christians today have been affected by the life of Paul. Because Paul no longer spoke Merely out of theological understanding and renderings. But he spoke out of relationship with Jesus Christ. The only way that anyone can truly know Jesus Christ is through a true relationship with him. I want to touch on one more area. As we close. Evangelism flows out of worship. Evangelism flows out of worship. You see, ministry is a product of spiritual light. And it flows from intimate communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people want to go out there and they want to, they want to reach the lost. But they don't even know Jesus Christ Himself. They, they may have an understanding of him, but they don't. But they don't know him. Many times we, we 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 go through for years, for years. There's people that go for years and they never win anyone to Jesus Christ. 
And I tell you, that's not Christ's fault. It's not His fault. It's ours. Because, because evangelism comes out of worship. Out of ministering to Christ. Out of ministering to Him. You see, you and I have nothing to offer the world except what we receive of Christ. We have no hope to offer the world. And that's the problem with the world. And that's the problem that the church has had a stigma with. Is, is because the church has, has, has promised something that she has not been able to deliver. If you're sick, come. You'll be healed. If you're bound, Jesus said, you'll be set free. Jesus said, Jesus himself said, in quoting Isaiah, I've come to preach deliverance to the captives, to set them free. Those who are held in bondage and sin. And, and so what the world has done is they've come and they've come to the church and, and they've come and nothing's changed. They've stepped in and they've stepped out. No difference, no change. <clears throat> We used to say, you won't leave here. And the songwriter used to say, you won't leave here the same way that you came in Jesus' name. Now the problem is, is too many times people leave just like they came and sometimes even worse. Because all they've done is gained an understanding but never a fellowship and a relationship and a walking with Christ. But as you grow in your intimate fellowship with Jesus Christ and your worship to Him and your service to Him. The Scripture abounds with this truth. On the day of Pentecost 3,000 souls were saved. That's evangelism. That's ministry. But it's not merely about the 3,000 people that are saved. What about the one? What about the one that Jesus leads us to? You know why you're ashamed? You're, you know why you're embarrassed? You know why you're afraid? Because the lack of relationship. And Jesus said this. He said, if you'll be embarrassed of me in front of man and in this world, when you come before my Father, I'll be embarrassed of you. I'll be ashamed of you. Can I tell you this? If he's ashamed of me, there's only one other place for me. And I don't have to tell you what that is, but I'm going to. It's hell. Because it's only as my relationship with Jesus Christ. My relationship with Jesus Christ is the only, is the only thing that saves me. There's a lot of Bible-believing people in hell today. But there's not one that truly knew, knew Christ. And that truly knows Christ. Satan has deceived many. You see, all of it, everything that you and I will ever do for God, it comes out of our prayer life. It comes out of ministering. It comes because of the Spirit of God. It comes as the Spirit of God it, it anoints us in worship. Well, why do you think that, that we do services the way that we do. You see, some people think we come to church and, and, and we'll have a time of worship. And then we know that we're going to have the, the, the message. And, and then we're just going to and then we're just going to pray and we're going to dismiss. And then we're going to go home and we're going to live our own lives the next six days. Whatever. Now, the reason we come in and we start with worship it's because we want to worship and we want to serve God and we want to prepare the atmosphere because there's nothing that we have to offer until we have given ourselves over to Jesus Christ. And as the exchange takes place, as we worship Him in prayer, in worship, in singing, and all of these things, we, that, that exchange is taking place and the atmosphere is being prepared for the presence of God to do what He can only do. Nine days and nine nights 
in an upper room. They were praying and praying. And the Spirit of God fell upon 120 men and women. And they stepped out of the room. And Peter stands on the balcony and preaches a powerful message under the influence of the Holy Spirit. It didn't come from Peter. It came out of relationship and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And as the Spirit of God spoke through him, the power of God and the hand of God began to move across that place. And the people began to cry out to God, what shall we do to be saved? You want to see that same power taking place in your own life? God is no respecter of persons. What He did for you, for, for Moses, what He's done for Peter, what He did for, for Paul, He'll do for me. He'll do it for you. He's waiting for the seeking heart, for the heart, the person that is willing to pray. Don't get tired. Don't grow weary in well-doing because in due season, you're going to reap a harvest if you don't faint. If you don't stop, would you stand this morning? In Acts chapter two, verse eleven, they were they were they were all speaking in tongues. The people that were gathered, they said, "We do hear them speak the wonderful things of God." You see, it's a miracle. You know, you, you know, when they were speaking in tongues, they not on their own ability. They had begun to speak different languages, every one of them. And it was a time when, when the people had come from all around to, to Jerusalem. And so there was 120 people speaking in tongues and their tongues were, were, the, the, were, were in the native languages of those who were out there. Can I tell you this? Those disciples and those 120 people did not even know what they were saying. You see, it was God ministering through them. God is looking for a vessel. And as I look around, I see the potential of what God can do in your life and in my life and in your world and mine. And let me ask you something. What greater gift could you give Christ than to surrender and give Him back the life that He gave you? What greater gift could you give Him and the life that He gave you. And surrendering to Him and saying, God, I want to be used by you. I want to be all yours. Listen to me. This life is but a vapor. You're here today. You're gone tomorrow. But the life to come, that eternal life, you will be there whether in heaven or in hell throughout an eternity. And if you think this last year was a long year, you don't understand what eternity is. Because when you've been there a thousand years, you've only begun. When you've been there a million years, you haven't even scratched the surface. Time hasn't even, because there is no time. And you, there will never be an end to that eternity. Wouldn't you rather spend it with God who created the universes and everything in them and the earth and the fullness thereof and all of the things the Word of God says that eye has not seen and ear has not heard and nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has gone away to prepare for us. It's not going to be just this little little party by and by and then what are we going to do? We're going to sit around each other with our arms folded. No, it's going to be one from one stage to another, we're going to see the glory of God and never get tired of the glory of God. And all that we see in heaven, the world couldn't even think of, of equaling what, what heaven has to offer to us. And yet God is standing here and He offers it to you and me. And, and you know, the beautiful thing about it is that He even offers it to us here and now to an extent. The Bible says that He would give us life and that more abundant. That you could know the joy and the peace and the favor of Jesus Christ here and now. By making a choice to walk intimately with Him. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you, that, uh, I want to ask you this morning, We've all had to do this, those of us that have come to know Jesus Christ. We've all had to do this. 
So I'm not, not, I'm not ashamed of it. I'd do it again and again and again if I had to. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and I think I made it pretty clear in the message, there's a difference between knowing about Christ and knowing Christ personally. If that's you today, and you would say, you know, Pastor, I don't know Jesus Christ personally, intimately, but I want to know Him. I want to know Him. I want you just, you can raise your hand up and put it right back right down. Amen. Who else? Praise God. Praise God. Don't let it pass you by. But give it over to Jesus Christ. I want to pray with you. And as we pray, I want you church to pray with me. The Bible says we believe in our heart, confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. He's faithful, just to forgive us of all of our sins. At that moment, He cleanses you, washes you, and brings you, and welcomes you into the family. And at that moment, you have a relationship. You, you begin your relationship with Jesus Christ. But it's only the beginning. From now on, from that moment on, you begin to search His Word. And to get down and to seek His face in prayer. And to get to know Him. And so as you pray, those of you that raise your hand, and all of you, would you pray with me? As you pray that it's going to begin the process. And I encourage you to be here the next, the next 12 weeks in the morning. Go through these beginner's classes and learn of the foundation of what we believe. So let's pray. Father, forgive me because I am a sinner. And I accept what you did on the cross for me. You sacrificed yourself. Your body was torn. Your blood shed for my sins. That I might have fellowship with you. Today, I receive you as my Savior, as my Lord, and my God. In Jesus' name.